Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Meg Huang. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Connected Health Policy. And today you are attending the Federal and State Telehealth Policy Updates webinar on Medicare current year 2019 and other policy changes. I'm joined today by Christine Calero, also with the Center for Connected Health Policy, and Jonathan Neufeld from the Great Plains Telehealth Resource Center. This webinar is being sponsored by the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. And we have a few housekeeping details for you uh, before we begin. Please note that we will be recording today's webinar and we will be posting it later after the webinar has been completed. Additionally, if you have questions, please type them into the question chat box that you will find on your screen and we will reserve those questions for after the presentation. So without further ado, we, go, we will go ahead and begin. So a little bit of background on the telehealth resource centers. There are 14 telehealth resource centers that work collaboratively together. We are funded through a uh, grant process from HRSA. Uh, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers. They cover specific states throughout the country. Jonathan is with the Great Plains one. There are also two national telehealth resource centers. One is on technology and one is on policy. Uh, that is where Christina and I are with. And we all work collaboratively together in order to really be a one-stop shop for your telehealth questions. If you have questions on how to start a program or how you may want to um, uh, alter or to expand perhaps your telehealth, existing telehealth program, really contact your telehealth resource centers first. The regional telehealth resource centers have some of the most experienced and educated people in the telehealth field. They are really your front line to go to for information. And they're backed up by the National Resource Centers who will help them out on questions regarding technology or policy. A few disclaimers before we begin. So neither the staff at the Center for Connected Health Policy or Jonathan at Great Plains are providing you with legal advice or counsel. If you are looking for a formal legal opinion, we always suggest you seek out legal counsel. And if we happen to mention a company or show some type of device, please know that none of us have any uh, fiscal arrangement or relationship with such a company. A little bit of background about CCHP. We are the National Telehealth Policy Research Center, but we started off as the uh, uh, California Telehealth Policy Center. Uh, we became the National Telehealth Policy Resource Center in 2012 and been serving in that capacity ever since. And what that means, along with providing technical assistance telehealth resource centers. We're here also to provide that type of assistance to folks who may have just general questions. Uh, we help everybody from congressional members to state legislative members to hospitals, providers, and to consumers. And really that's also the group that the telehealth resource centers on the regional level also provide as well. We also have at CCHP an interactive uh, state policy map and compendium. Uh, we do this compendium twice a year, we update it, and it tracks all of the Medicaid reimbursement policies, private payer reimbursement laws, and uh, regulations related to telehealth for all 50 states in the District of Columbia. That's a snapshot of our website. It's an interactive map, so you can click on it and pull up the information for a particular state you may be interested in. And we also track any pending legislation as well. So the pending legislation given where we are in the time of the year, maybe a little less full right now, but starting in 2019, you may want to check it out a little bit more frequently. Uh, we do keep that portion a bit more frequently updated as a piece of legislation goes through the process. Uh, the other information, such as the Medicaid reimbursement items, we update that occasionally, but it definitely gets a major update twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And currently the information is good up until October 31st of this year. A little bit of background. So we're here today really to talk more about Medicare and the recent changes that are, have been proposed and approved now for current year 2019. Probably a lot of you are aware there hasn't been much change on Medicare telehealth policy, at least on the uh, statutory level, for quite a while. The last major change was around 2008. But there have been various administrative changes that have been made since that time. And really, these last couple of years have been quite a bit of movement, I would say, on the Medicare side, at least administratively for the changes that they've decided to make regarding telehealth policy. Now, the statute on telehealth policy for Medicare 
is fairly limited. And this is in federal law, so it would require an act of Congress to change it. And while there have been bills introduced to make those changes, they haven't really gone too far. Although there have been pieces of those bills that have been put into other bills that have been passed, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But really what we have for telehealth reimbursement in Medicare is a fairly limited type of policy. Really only live video is reimbursed unless you're in Hawaii or Alaska in a demonstration pilot. There's a very specific list of eligible providers who get reimbursed. And one of the major barriers is that it's limited to, uh, limited to specific areas of where a telehealth interaction takes place can get reimbursed by Medicare, and that's a rural area, area or a non-MSA area or again, telehealth demonstration projects. And there's also a limited type, a limitation on the type of site where a telehealth interaction can take place and limited services. Now, for originating sites beginning in two, uh, beginning of uh, next year, they're actually expanding it, but in a very specific way. And these are some of the federal statutory changes that have taken place and that were part of other bills, not necessarily a telehealth only bill. So for originating sites, they are now, at least for renal dialysis facilities and um, ESRD services, they are expanding those types of services and they are eliminating the real limitation for those services in a hospital base or a, a CH a CAH-based renal dialysis center or renal dialysis facilities for the pump. So right now you have like, at least for this particular service, ESRD related services, you're having the home be an eligible site and you're also removing the rural limitation. But that does not mean all uh, other types of services or other types of sites will now have like that ex uh, exception for them. It's only for these particular services. You also have some of that for acute stroke. Again, um, you can have acute stroke take site or uh, take place in those who currently eligible originating sites, such as hospitals, doctors, offices, emergency rooms, et cetera. They've added a mobile strike unit or any location deemed appropriate by the secretary. So there's still a possibility that these sites can be expanded for acute stroke, um, but that would depend on what the secretary decides and what list we come out for. So for uh, renal dialysis facilities and home, you, uh, they are um, excluded from having uh, you know, the acute stroke exception for them. So for acute stroke diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment symptoms, the originating site limitations don't apply. So again, they also, like for the SPDR, uh, renal dialysis facilities don't have that real exception applied to, to them. So again, we're seeing exceptions for very specific services, it's very narrow, but it is an exception to that rural limitation. But one thing that some of these uh, places don't get is their facility fee, which it kind of makes sense if you have your origin site now be the home, probably they shouldn't be getting a facility fee. But also in the um, case of the acute stroke, uh, those sites that are eliminated from geographical restrictions, they also do not get and also they will be creating, CMS will be creating a new modifier for acute stroke. Um, and those types of services and eligible, uh, for, for eligible providers, those types of services and the providers who are eligible for reimbursement, that did not change. So that could have some impact on how expansive these new changes here for urgent sites might be in that certain providers are still limited to being eligible for uh, reimbursement. So it is a little bit complicated because now you have a couple of these little exceptions to what we're typically used to, but it's very narrow because it only applies to certain services. And certain services, so what did they do regarding telehealth? Well, they did add a couple of new codes. So what CMS usually does is that every year there are two ways of getting existing codes um, eligible for telehealth reimbursement. And they go through what they call a category one or a category two exception or approval process in category one. It's basically if the service is similar to what they're already reimbursing another telehealth service. Uh, for category two, it's if you provide sufficient evidence to convince them that it would be, um, it, that the service that provided via telehealth would be very similar or the same as it's presented in person. It's kind of hard really to get services approved through those two categories. And we only see really each year a handful of services that they will approve. This year they approved two, uh, prolonged preventive services uh, beyond the typical type of service procedure in the office or outpatient setting. 
Um, so those are two new services they provide via telehealth that they will approve for reimbursement. Now, that is for telehealth services. And I, I stress that particularly because what they have started doing at CMS and where we've started seeing a lot of these administrative changes that have impacted telehealth policy without going through the legislative process and going through Congress and getting a bill passed is that CMS has started to define things a little bit differently. Basically, if they define a service as something else and they do not call it telehealth, then they have argued that they are given the reason that they are not restricted by law because it is not a telehealth service, it's something else. It may be using telehealth technologies, but because it's not called telehealth, they are not limited by those usual telehealth restrictions that we see in federal law. So they actually started doing this back in around 2019 around chronic care management codes. So they labeled something that was really using remote patient monitoring or was remote patient monitoring service, they called it chronic care management and they started reimbursing for it. So for uh, 2019, they have added a couple of more codes that will um, allow for reimbursement. Again, they are using remote monitoring technology. It is remote, uh, remote patient monitoring, but it is all, it's underneath chronic care management. So the usual limitations of like rural and certain uh, locations that you see surrounding telehealth do not apply. There are, I will stress, there are other limitations, other uh, elements that you are required to fill in order to be eligible for reimbursement, but what we see in statute for telehealth does not apply. So they used some of that reasoning of uh, basically it's not called telehealth or it's not the telehealth services that are listed in statute and are restricted and applied it to something new this year. So this year they proposed three things that they have not called telehealth, but are basically telehealth, using telehealth technology to provide services, and they are, will start reimbursing for them on January 1st. And they are brief communication technology-based services, or what they call the virtual check-in, remote evaluation of pre-recorded patient information, information, and interprofessional internet consultation. So the first one, the virtual check-in, got the uh, code G2, uh, 012, basically it's a brief communication with a healthcare provider. So the patient will initiate a call with their provider, let's say, and, and ask them like, you know, um, do I need to come in? I have bats. And if it doesn't result in a in, in office visit or uh, with the provider within <clears throat> like a seven day range, if it's not something that is uh, seven days before a result of like an in office visit or a result in an in office visit, then the provider can charge for that visit or bill that visit and will get reimbursed by Medicare. Um, it can be done over the phone. It is only for established patients. So it's not like a new patient calls uh, the doctor that they've never seen before and to do this. And this will be a visit that will be reimbursed by CMS, the established patient. There also needs to be consent involved um, from the patient that you know, they agree to do this. You may assume that it, it's sort of uh, given because they probably initiated the call, but there needs to be some consent involved. And really this last point is something that they stress for all of these new, new uh, services that they are going to reimburse for. And they said the patient must be informed that they will be responsible for any copayment or deductible. So that was really stressed in the final proposal in the reasoning and the background information CMS provided when they released that information. Remote evaluation of pre-recorded information, it's the same concept, but it is using the store forward or asynchronous version of the technology. Patient sends in to their doctor a picture of, let's say, a skin rash or something like that. Um, the doctor says, no, you don't need to come in. It looks like it's going fine. Let's you know, do another visit in like two weeks or something like that. So that is something that the uh, provider can bill for now. And it has sort of the same parameters, parameters around it. It's only for its application, patient responsible for any copayment or deductible. And it's really interesting that they are now reimbursing or saying that they will reimburse for these types of services. But these are probably services that uh, providers have been providing in the past and not getting paid for, um, regardless of whether it's via telehealth or in person or in the, over the phone. So this is something that is new. It is not valued at a very high rate. It's about $14 a visit. 
So it's not a lot of money, but CMS's reasoning is that they think this will avoid a lot of unnecessary visits, be a little more efficient in how things are run and how the provider's time is spent. You know, spent maybe not on like something that's like just a quick check-in and they didn't necessarily need to see the patient in person in the office and will allow them to put more time to more, uh, more serious cases. The other thing that CMS have proposed and will start reimbursing for is interprofessional internet consultation. So um, I know this term has various definitions and it's used in various ways throughout the country. But for some folks, you may be familiar with the uh, concept of e-consult, which is a uh, provider-to-provider -provider consultation that takes place over a secure platform that is has contains more, more information than what most people may be familiar with when done in person in a curbside consult. So this is the actual transfer of records, it's over a secure system, there's a, a real like ex real extensive write-up on what's going on. Um, and the care but the care remains with the original provider, usually the primary care provider. And the specialist is just giving their uh, advice or their uh, counsel on how to treat that particular patient. CMS Medicare is now offering to reimburse for that consultation. So, and they are interestingly offering to reimburse both providers. So the time of the primary care provider takes in order to do all that write up and like have that interaction with that other healthcare professional and the time that the, uh, that it takes the healthcare professional to write that up as well. Again, this one will require verbal consent and their cost sharing with the patient needs to be disclosed and it could be over internet or phone between two providers. So that is something new and a little bit different that they are proposing to reimburse. And again, probably one of the services that a lot of providers were originally doing, but perhaps not getting paid. So really quickly, a couple of changes that were also interesting were around opioid and substance abuse disorder. Um, again, this is where we're seeing like a very narrow exception to that geographic site requirement. So this is like for acute stroke and uh, end stage renal, renal disease, you're seeing an exception here, at least on the geographical requirement, you're using telehealth um, for some substance use disorder that somebody is uh, diagnosed with or a co-occurring mental health disorder. They are also making the home uh, and the eligible originating site, again, would not qualify as a home for uh, facility fee. And then a report needs to be written. They're, they're going to evaluate this after five years to see, like, you know, what was the impact? Did this really help out a little bit? So, again, a very narrowly focused policy change in what we're used to around the telehealth policies and Medicare. Uh, these are just a couple other things that we've seen recently as far as um, opioid and substance use disorder treatments and telehealth. There have been certain guidances that have been issued by CMS, but the, really the one I want to point out was that last bullet point. It's that one thing that is changing that should have an impact on telehealth is that the DEA is now given a deadline as to when they must have a special registration set up. So when the Ryan Hate Act passed, and that is the act that actually had a set of narrow exceptions for when you can use telehealth to prescribe a controlled substance, which a lot of those controlled substances are used to treat a substance use disorder as you wean off the patient. Uh, the DEA was also asked to create a special registration for telehealth providers where if you sign on, essentially the theory was if you sign on, you got a special license, you're good to like um, prescribe over telehealth because you passed all of their requirements and everything to get on the special registry. Well, the DEA, and it's been about seven or eight years, didn't really seem in a hurry to create the registration. And Congress uh, over the last the past year basically said, you've got a year now to, to do it. So that is something definitely worth look out for in 2019 because there was really no um, parameters or no uh, elements that they dictated the registration we didn't have. So we're not quite sure what that registration or that registry might look like, what might be required of the providers in order to be able to get on it. So that will be interesting to watch and watch here and see how that develops. And I will stop right now because you're probably tired of hearing from me and turn it over to Jonathan. All right. Thank you, May. Um, do we, uh, 
Did we lose our slides? Oh, do you want me to go ahead and keep up? Yeah, go ahead and uh, put on seven, okay. put on slide 17, and I'll just let you bounce through them, and then I don't have to take over. Okay. So um, I work with a lot of uh, FQHCs and RHCs, and we wanted to, in talking about uh, some of the changes that are coming down uh, from Medicare, uh, we wanted to specifically spend just a couple of minutes talking about FQHCs and RHCs because they are sort of an island in the healthcare world. They're a very critical island and a, and a, uh, a large part of HRSA's interest, of course, in, in healthcare and the safety net. Um, but uh, they are treated differently and treated uh, especially in uh, lots of different ways. And so we wanted to just uh, make a couple of comments about FQHCs and RHCs. They are mentioned specifically in these changes in Medicare, but it's important to recognize, of course, if you work in these facilities, you know this, but Medicare um, may only be a small pr proportion of uh, your payer mix. Um, if it's significant, great, then Medicare rules that specifically apply to FQHCs and RHCs would apply to you for those Medicare patients. But uh, by and large, uh, the vast majority of patients in these settings are, um, uh, are subscribed to Medicaid. So what you can do with telehealth um, in an FQHC or RHC is driven by state policy, state Medicaid policy. And so just as a, as a way of sort of clarifying this, I mean, it might might go without saying, but we just want to make sure that you recognize if you're in one of those settings and you're interested in telehealth and you're wondering how these new rules apply, um, it's important to recognize that number one, what you can or can't do or what you can or can't get paid for as an FQHC or RHC usually will have a lot to do, uh, it'll have more to do or a significant amount to do with Medicaid rather than Medicare. And Medicaid policies will vary from state to state. Just as a sort of a heads up, we see across states three general patterns of how Medicaid decides to pay for telehealth in FQHCs and RHCs. And, um, and it even can vary between the two of them just based on, on how state Medicaid policy is written. But one is what, what I would call strict, and that is that um, it sort of follows the Medicare example, which Medicare says that you can, an FQHC or an RHC can be an originating site, that is the site where the patient is, but can't be the site where the physician is and where the physician more appropriately uh, or more to the point, the site out of which the physician is billing. Okay, so the FQHC in, a, in that setting or RHC can't bill for the professional fee. That's what's implied by this uh, situation in which they can only be the originating site. They can have the patient, they can get a facility fee for the patient, which is about uh, $25, $26. It's separate from their PPS or APM rates, um, but, um, but they can only be that originating site. Some states have that kind of a strict policy. Others have what I would call a moderate policy, which will, allows for FQHCs to use telehealth between their own sites. So if an FQHC has multiple sites and they have a Mental health is, is, is a common one. They have a mental health practitioner at one site. Uh, that person can see patients at the other sites within that FQHC and bill a PPS rate for that service. So in that sense, the, the originating site and the provider site are both, or the distant site are both within the same organization and that organization has the right then to bill for services. A, a third variation of this that I would call the generous variation is one where, um, uh, and, it, and it is applicable because a lot of FQHCs would like to, for example, hire a psychiatrist off-site to see patients on-site or hire a clinical social worker or some other specialist, a cardiologist, pulmonologist, neurologist, somebody to come in and see their patients, but that person is going to be distant. So they're going to sort of telecommute or virtually enter the four walls and see the patient. That's, um, that's a tougher or a less commonly reimbursed situation. It many states, I shouldn't say many, some states do allow it, um, but not all. So as you're, if you're in an FQHC or an RHC and you're thinking about doing telehealth, it's important to recognize, bottom line is it's important to recognize what Medicaid um, is gonna pay for in that setting. Go ahead and go to the next slide, May. So now 
that being said, that sort of background being said, um, what the FQHC and RHC implications of these new changes for calendar year 2019 and CMS are, uh, are as follows. Um, they can provide uh, and be, in, be reimbursed for the virtual check-ins that May just described and for the remote uh, evaluation services, okay? Those services are, uh, a, again, they're a fairly, they have a fairly low reimbursement rate. This is not a, this is not a, a complete consult. This is not a complete E&M evaluation or anything like that. It's a, a virtual check-in, it's brief, and they're paid those services outside of the PPS or alternative payment mechanism. Um, they, uh, so it's a, so it's available and it's available for those, for that specific set of services. Um, the patient receiving services, and this is really sort of a restatement of one, one of the things she says, they need to be an active patient. In other words, they need to have been seen in the past year. That's how CMS is defining an active patient. It needs to be provided by a practitioner in the FQHC or RHC. I mean, that, that seems fairly obvious, but it is, but it's intended to be an FQHC or RHC, RHC service. So it needs to be a practitioner from that service. You can't just contract to have somebody else see your patients and bill for that service. Um, they're not able to use the interprofessional consultation codes. So that's, I, that's a limitation uh, of the application to FQHCs, RHCs. And as before, May mentioned, coinsurance is going to apply. So if there are deductibles or uh, other other situations, you know, where the where the patient may be responsible for some portion of care, they need to be aware of that. And at this point, they're not putting any limitations on how often it can happen. So that's just a little. We just wanted, as I said, I just we just wanted to make a little bit of a set a little bit of context and make some specific comments about how these rules apply in the FQHC and RHC setting because uh, it is sort of significant and sort of uh, on an island by itself in some ways with regard to telehealth. Um, I think I'm now going to be handing it off to Christine to continue. Great, thanks. Let me just uh, share my slides. Okay, so I'm going to share a little bit about Medicare Advantage and talk about the CMS proposed rule to make changes to Medicare Advantage based on the requirements of the Bipartisan Budget Act. Um, now keep in mind that this is still in a proposal phase. Um, CMS is accepting comments on this until the end of the year. And even once this is finalized, it won't be applicable until plan year 2020. So we have some time before this is actually implemented. So to understand the changes in Medicare Advantage uh, for telehealth, first, uh, I think it's necessary to understand the way Medicare Advantage currently treats uh, telehealth. So currently, Medicare Advantage plans uh, subject telehealth services to the same restrictions that apply uh, to Medicare generally, so that means uh, all of those service restrictions, uh, restrictions on the patient's originating site, and restrictions on those services uh, still apply for Medicare Advantage plans. However, if they want to go over and beyond that, they can do that, but they must offer it as a supplemental benefit. And those supplemental benefits are funded through the use of rebate dollars or supplemental premiums paid by enrollees. Now, the change coming in 2020 uh, gives Medicare Advantage plans the option to provide uh, reimbursement for uh, what they term additional telehealth benefits. And those additional telehealth benefits would be treated the same as uh, traditional Medicare Part B services without all of those telehealth limitations. Uh, the way they define an additional telehealth benefit is that it must be a service already covered under Medicare Part B but just doesn't qualify because of all the telehealth restrictions, and in addition, it must be identified as clinically appropriate to deliver via electronic exchange. And the way that the rule uh, defines a, a electronic exchange is fairly broad. Basically, it includes any type of telecommunication technology, and they give a few examples, such as secure messaging, store and forward or live video or telephone. 
Um, they said in the uh, reasoning that they uh, wanted to maintain a very broad definition so that they could accommodate for any changes in technology that occur in the future. So you may be wondering uh, what and who decides what is medically appropriate for these additional telehealth benefits. And in the proposed rule, CMS proposes to allow the Medicare Advantage plans themselves to decide uh, what is medically appropriate as long as the services are covered under um, Medicare Part B. In addition, th uh, the services also have to be available under the Medicare Advantage plan in person. And they do this in order to maintain patient choice. They stress this in the proposed rule that it's very important that the patient be able to decide whether they want to receive the service in person or uh, via telehealth. And then the way that they'll let um, patients uh, and providers know what they're going to offer as an additional telehealth benefit is through the evidence of coverage document that they release on a yearly basis. And then in addition to that, they would need to um, identify in their provider directory the providers that uh, would be offering these telehealth benefits. Um, the plans would also need to comply with uh, provider selection and credentialing requirements. Um, plans would uh, be required to provide CMS with information on the additional telehealth benefits whenever CMS requests it. Uh, CMS says that this is uh, so that they will have data so that they can know whether or not changes in the rule need to be made or whether guidance documents need to be issued. Um, the additional telehealth benefits under the proposed rule would only be for uh, contracted providers. Uh, if it's a non-contracted provider, they could still offer that, but it would be covered under the supplemental plan, not the additional telehealth benefit. And then uh, services provided as additional telehealth benefits uh, would need to meet access and coverage requirements. And of course, state laws regarding the practice of medicine would still apply. So even though the, um, the MA plan would decide uh, what is medically appropriate to be delivered as the additional telehealth benefit, um, the provider, it does not exempt the provider from their responsibility to determine whether a, a specific service is appropriate to deliver via telehealth in a specific situation. Um, and then if the services are not typically covered under uh, Medicare Part B or the service does not meet any of the, uh, all of the requirements that I just talked about, then um, they can still be offered. It would just be as a supplemental benefit not under the, uh, the additional telehealth benefit. And I just want to stress that all of this is not mandatory for Medicare Advantage plans, it's just going to be an option. So as I said, uh, CMS is still in the uh, proposed rule phase of this and they are soliciting comments. You can make comments on any part of the rule, but in particular, they're asking for uh, comments related to whether or not they should place any additional restrictions on the benefit, uh, such as service codes or specialty, um, how the additional telehealth benefits should factor into network adequacy assessments, and uh, any additional requirements for providers. So if you have any comments, you should get them in before the end of the year. So now I'm just going to briefly cover um, state uh, telehealth policies. And as uh, May mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, at CCHP twice a year, we do a scan of state telehealth laws, regulations, and reimbursement policies uh, for Medicaid private payers and other uh, telehealth uh, policies. And the, this is some of the results that we found in our last fall update from September 2018. So, um, we found that uh, 49 states and DC Medicaid programs are currently re reimbursing for a live video in some way. However, this can vary uh, quite widely depending on what state you're looking at. Um, some states uh, only reimburse for a very narrow uh, portion of services such as mental health, while other states may reimburse for a wide variety of services or even allow the provider to decide um, what's medically appropriate to be delivered via telehealth. Um, we have 11 states that currently reimburse in some way for Storm Ford. 
uh, but this is also often limited to specific uh, specialties such as dermatology or ophthalmology. And then 20 states reimburse for remote patient monitoring, uh, but also lots of limitations often associated with this. Um, a common one is to limit it to only patients with certain chronic conditions, such as COPD, diabetes, or uh, chronic heart failure. Uh, so because uh, CCHP has been doing this for quite a few years now, these are some of the uh, trends that we've noticed that, that have started occurring in the last um, year or so as state Medicaid programs have gotten more experience with telehealth. Um, they've started to uh, expand their the originating sites that they will accept uh, for telehealth services as well as the specialties. And I have some examples here. We have 13 states that are now explicitly allowing the home to be a patient site for Medicaid, um, 15 states that allow the school as a patient site, um, seven states now that allow for teledentistry, uh, that's a growing uh, area of interest for telehealth, and then 13 states are now allowing FQHCs or RHCs to be distance sites, and this is significant because Medicare does not allow for this, and so whenever we find this explicitly uh, written in a state Medicaid policy, we notate it. Um, other general trends is for states to be reducing some of those additional barriers uh, to uh, access to telehealth services. And I have two examples here. One is New Hampshire, who uh, recently eliminated their geographic barrier. They had previously followed Medicare's um, uh, rural requirement for patients, but they have since eliminated that. Also, Vermont uh, used to have a specific list of providers that could provide telehealth services, um, but they uh, have also eliminated that restriction now and allow any Medicaid uh, contracted provider to uh, provide services via telehealth. On the uh, private payer side of things, uh, CCHP has found that there's a good portion of states now that have these laws that govern in some way the way that private payers uh, reimburse for telehealth, 39 states in DC. Not all of these laws require reimbursement of telehealth. Some of them just say that a state, or excuse me, a private payer may reimburse for telehealth, but does not require it. An example of that is Massachusetts. Also, uh, not all the laws that require reimbursement require the same rate of payment for telehealth delivered services versus in-person services. Uh, actually, CCHP has found that only three states that we can find explicitly have language in their laws that require the same payment rate uh, for telehealth delivered services. And then uh, CCHP does, as May mentioned, uh, track state uh, legislation. Uh, this uh, year, we tracked over 200 bills in all the states, and these are some of the trends that we have found. Um, for the different topic areas that the bills fit into. So you can see that one of the most popular areas was pilots and demonstration projects. And this has mainly been fueled by the opioid epidemic and the introduction of legislation for pilots related to addressing that and including uh, telehealth in it in some way. Um, other areas of interest have been Medicaid reimbursement, um, cross-state licensing, and those telehealth practice standards for the professions. <laughs> And um, CCHP, uh, I think as May mentioned as well, we do track um, the legislation going through the states. Um, so if you haven't already, you should check out our website. Um, it is updated on a daily basis. And then these are some of uh, the resources, our, our, each of our individual organization websites, as well as the Telehealth Resource Center website. And I think that's all we have for you. I think we're gonna open it up to questions now. Thank you, Christine. Can you go back to the uh, oh, website? Excuse me? Could you go back to the previous slide? And Christine, can you just move the mic? Sorry, our, our apologies, Christine and I are in the same office, so sometimes we get a little bit of feedback. Um, we are opening it up now for questions, and we have some in the queue. There is one that Jonathan already answered, 
and Jonathan's been busy answering your questions if you hadn't realized that. But there is one he did answer, but I also wanted to clarify because it is confusing and it came from a Melinda Levering regarding the acute stroke services. So to break it down, and it is confusing, and it's been in the back of my head that we really need to create a chart about these region A sites so we can see like where all the little exceptions are in like one handy little one pager. So for acute stroke, what they are saying now is that those acute stroke services can take place in all of the uh, typical originating telehealth sites, originating sites that are currently eligible to provide telehealth services, again, doctor's offices, hospitals, critical access hospitals, FQHC, those are still eligible. They're adding on now um, mobile st uh, stroke units uh, or any location deemed uh, appropriate by the secretary. So those are a couple of new sites, or at least one new site that we don't know if the secretary is going to have another list of eligible sites. But we do know that there's, at least for acute stroke services, one additional eligible originate site, which is a mobile um, stroke unit. What they're also saying is that if you are providing stroke services, diagnosis, evaluation, treatment of symptoms, originating site limitations do not apply. So that rule restriction will not apply to the mobile uh, stroke units and anything the uh, secretary comes up with and the originating sites that we typically see now. Again, hospitals, FQHCs, um, critical access hospitals. So that rule restriction will not apply only for those acute stroke services. However, if you are hoping to get a facility fee, you will only get that if you are one of those originating sites that we see now in law and you're in a rural area. So if you are, let's say, an urban hospital, let's say you're in the middle of downtown LA, you're an uh, urban hospital there, you provide stroke services via telehealth, you can uh, be that eligible originating site, but you will not get paid that facility fee. Unlike, let's say, you are a hospital in the middle of uh, Wyoming in a rural area that is eligible, you would get the originating site fee. Amazing, I know. So you have like these little exceptions here and there, but that is what the rules are saying right now. So I hope that clarified things for Melinda and anybody else who's confused. So we will see what other questions we have. Um, let's see what came in first. We'll try to take these in order here. So uh, there was one from a Corey. Do you know the status of the Connect app? Are G20112 and G20110 considered telehealth? If not, are they reimbursed if FQHC is the assistance site provider? Can we get Jonathan's contact? So that's why I left, asked Christine to go back to that slide there with our website. You can contact any of us through our website. There is like an info email address in there or sometimes our direct information is on there as well. As far as the Connect app, so there were pieces of the Connect app that have been placed in other bills, but the Connect app itself in total is not, it hasn't really gone anywhere. But what they have been doing is slicing pieces out of that and like dropping it into other bills. And that's that's kind of what we've been seeing with these uh, a couple of these changes that we've seen going through here, such as the um, budget, uh, the budget act that passed earlier this year, which means slices of telehealth bills that are dropping into other uh, pieces here. So your other question though regarding the G two O one and two O ten code. Um, hold on, one second. Let me double check to make sure I'm remembering the right codes. Um, are they considered telehealth? So they use telehealth technology, but they are not calling it telehealth. And that is how CMS is, is saying that like, that is why the restrictions around telehealth, like the rural restrictions don't apply. So it's not called telehealth, but it is using telehealth technology. Um, if not, are they reimbursed if that QHC is the distance site provider? So, so this is not about being the distance site provider, it is being contacted by the patient directly. So it's, it's basically the provider being contacted through telehealth. And they did say, as Jonathan went over, they are allowed to bill for these two specific codes. They are not allowed to bill the PPS rate or they, the ARR, um, I think it's called the AIR, uh, rate for RHCs, for rural health centers. They have to bill a rate that's going to be very similar to what uh, non-FQACs would bill. Um, receive, which is about $14. Um, 
So it's not a lot of money. Uh, they can build it, but it's it's not like it's going to be the best. Thing. So what types? Uh, next question: What type of devices are covered, required for CPT code, CPT code nine nine four five four? Actually, don't think there's. A, and I'm, I'm looking, Christine. I don't think there's like a specific requirement on the uh, device. As far as like what device you need to use, and you're shaking your head. I can chime in there. Um, there's, I don't know of any any specific devices. I think that uh, the intention there is that it needs to be a device that can provide the physiological data that is of some sort of clinical relevance that justifies medical necessity of being monitored at home. I mean, that's kind of a standard, the standard language for any kind of services you provide. And then if you're going to have a device that, for example, you know, provides some sort of physiological data, if it is the kind of thing that requires FDA approval, then it's going to need to be FDA approved. Um, things like scales or, oh, I don't know, well, blood pressure cuffs would be approved. Uh, whether home scales uh, need approval, I actually don't know that. But, um, but uh, the Medicare and CMS don't, you know, list uh certain qualifications or certain brands or anything like that it just needs to be relevant for the for to justify you know medically necessary physiological monitoring i i will say for those chronic care, some of those chronic care management codes I, and i know it's caused confusion in the past they'll they'll say oh it's eligible for a qualified healthcare professional to charge for it and i know there's been confusion in the past it's, well what does that mean does that include like a nurse practitioner or what do you mean what do you mean by that? And I had heard um, in a CMS uh, a webinar that they did a few weeks ago that they will be coming out with, with like clarifying language on wh what that term includes and who it will be. So I, I know because we've gotten questions here at, at CCHP about that in the past. So if anybody's confused about that, there will be certain further clarification from CMS regarding um, some of these things that you know people might have a few more questions on. All right, so next question is, have you heard from organizations about how they plan to incorporate the new telehealth services, including in CY19 PFS? So not specifically, but I do know with the e-consult one, um, CCHP is based out of California, that there has been a, a project, a pretty extensive project in some of the health centers and with some of the private payers here in California who've been using the interprofessional consultation, the e-consult um, model for a while. So some of them have that already within their system and they're, we're happy now that there's gonna be reimbursement rate at least on the Medicare side. But I haven't heard how else anybody is going to be doing some of this. I don't know, maybe Jonathan, if you have. Yeah, certainly there's a lot of talk about how, a lot of consideration of how they might use these new codes. Um, I mean, to be pretty direct, some of the, some of the virtual codes are reimbursed, are not reimbursed such that somebody's going to build a whole business model around them. Let's put it that way. And so what organizations are saying is, you know, are there, are there phone calls that would qualify that we're not getting paid for now that we can figure out how to bill for? Um, because that's, I mean, the virtual check-in, is is really in in a lot of ways it's happening now it's just as somebody calls into the clinic and says hey you know i have this thing happening should i come in and see the doctor or can i get in and if they can take care of this of what the patient needs right then and there um and avoid an encounter well, that's a good thing for the clinic and they can get some reimbursement some modest reimbursement for that um on a larger scale organizations are are definitely thinking about how this adds to their overall telehealth strategy. That's, that's, a, that's a conversation though that is, has been ongoing for a lot of organizations and this is one new piece that's added to it. Um, for, for an organization that already has a large telehealth program or a large sort of um, uh, initiative around telehealth or a strategy, these may or may not be big, big enough changes to make a big difference in that. I also want to draw a distinction because I think it's it's sort of 
it, there's an impression being made that it's these 2019 PFS changes that are really driving a lot, especially in the in the health center, um, FQHC, RHC world. Those types of organizations are hearing a lot from HRSA the last few months about doing telehealth. They've gotten some extra funding for technology. They've they're being encouraged quite a bit to do telehealth. And one of the reasons we wanted to draw them out and separate them in this presentation was because these changes aren't specifically what's making the difference for CHCs and FQHCs and RHCs. These changes have just, I would say, I would characterize them as, a, as minor implications for those types of providers. The bigger implications are that HRSA is really encouraging CHCs to do this sort of thing. There are states that allow it and support it and you know, reimburse it. And so it is timely to be thinking about those sorts of strategies. But there aren't a lot of organizations that are just are seeing these PF. There aren't a lot of FQHCs and RHCs, let me limit it to that, that are looking at these PFS changes and saying, oh my goodness, that's going to make all the difference. Now we're going to go do telehealth. Because again, it's Medicare primarily. And even though in, in the Medicare that applies to the FQHCs and RHCs, that's a small portion of their business anyway, and they're limited in what they can use. So, so I don't want people to confuse the fact that they're hearing from HRSA about you know, getting, getting on board with telehealth and connecting that with these PFS changes. They're, they're somewhat independent, although there certainly is an awful lot of uh, um, excitement around telehealth uh, at HRSA and, and in the CHC community for sure. All right, um, Kendall Singleton again, let's see. Is there a way to monitor or search for maybe VSCH, CCHP telehealth policy that affects specific provider types, particularly interested in seeing how telehealth relates to registered dietitians? Um, probably, yes, you can probably uh, use the CCHP website regarding uh, state legislation and federal changes. We keep that fairly updated because so as changes happen and we go through the process, we put up updates. So that would probably be one of your best bets. I, I would also recommend uh, those who are in specific professions also check with your national organizations because usually they also keep track of such things as well. Um, but you can definitely use the CCHP website to see what might be uh, brewing out there. We will be releasing, um, we did a scan of OT and PT regulations here at CCHP this year. We'll be releasing that in like a month or so. So um, at least for, for that profession, uh, you'll have a little bit of information in one, one report, one area that, to see what's going on regarding telehealth. Uh, next question is, let's see, is there a report that summarizes the state laws that will be the CCHP 50 state compendium? Um, you can always look at the executive summary, which is uh, a summation of that. But even that is getting kind of long because it's there's just so much that's going on in the states, and it's also different. We do have a two-page infograph slash fact sheet on that, so that maybe if you are looking for like a very concise summary, that is it. If you want the longer version, there's the executive summary, and then if you want the whole burrito, you can look at like the 450-page uh, report that breaks it down by by category for every state and the District of Columbia. And that is available on our website. Go ahead and download it. That's all publicly available information. Um, any information on whether a private provider in Colorado providing services to those getting off benzodiazepines are still subject to Ryan Hate Pack? I currently have to get people from around the state to come to my office to be seen in person the first time I follow up with them on HIPAA compliant video conferencing. Do you see this ever changing when? So that would require change to the Ryan Hayne app. I think that policymakers are looking at doing that. Their first step was to essentially force the registry to, to be created. Um, when that may be happening, you know, it, it depends. It could happen Next year, it really depends on, it, that's federal law. So again, it's one of those requires an act of Congress to, to change things. So not related to telehealth, there's just a lot of things going on in DC that might um, impact getting a bill passed. So it could possibly, because this is, the, the opioid epidemic is a, a great concern to, to both sides. So we may see something next year. 
Um, but I'm not quite sure if that's actually going to happen. But it ha I think it has like a better chance than maybe some other policy changes in other areas. So uh, it, it's possible. It's possible that there may be people next year regarding that and making it a little bit more flexible uh, for um, providers to use telehealth and maybe not have, like in this situation, having them come in your office. What probably may help you, though, is if the registry gets up and running, if it's not too onerous to get on there and you know exactly what the registry would do, that may be the way to make it easier once that's up and running. I don't know, Jonathan, if you have anything you might want to add to that. I, I have been hearing of some recent changes in this, and it's because of the opioid epidemic specifically. Um, and I think we're probably going to have to, you're probably going to have to check back for details because I think it's still a little bit in process. But um, the, the Ryan Haight Act sort of, well, what it says is that, you know, you have to have a, an in-person, at least a lot of people interpret it, say, you need to see a person in person, um, physically, before you can prescribe a controlled substance. And um, there is a specific exception for telehealth or telemedicine, and um, except that the um, exact requirements for qualifying as a telemedicine provider um, uh, are not spelled out in the law. It says, you know, stay tuned and we'll tell you what it is, and then they never have. But I think there are some new guidance, there's some new guidance out about um, DEA registration of facilities. I think the new guidance is, uh, and this may be proposed guidance, I'm not sure if it's finalized yet, but if the patient is at a DEA registered facility uh, and the provider obviously has a DEA um, uh, license certification, um, then, they, then they are okay to do that prescribing of controlled substances um, without a physical encounter. Yeah. So, um, that's one change that has happened recently or is in, in the works. I'm not uh, exactly sure of the current status, but CCHP can probably be able to tell you that in a follow-up. Yeah, no, it's allowed. If you're a DEA registered facility and the patient is there and then the distance site provider is the one prescribing and they've only seen the patient through, through telehealth or telemedicine is what they use in Ryan and that is the term, then that is, that is legal. You, you can do that. Although, and maybe I'm just assuming, I think the questioner may have a, private office, so that may not actually apply in, in, in that case, like a private practice office. Right. And seeing patients at home for this sort of treatment is, that's still a little bit, I mean, that's a challenge. Yeah. Now, also remember, this is about prescribing. So you can't do the prescribing, but if you've seen them, you prescribe them, and then let's say you do a check-in with them to maybe look at the dosage or something like that. You can do that over telehealth. That's not prohibited. That's administration. So so it, the Ryan Hate just covers the prescribing part. So all that afterwards stuff you can do via telehealth. There's that, Ryan Haight Act doesn't cover that. Um, whether you get paid for it is another question. So, uh, let's see, next question. When there are more than two sites and each has a different PPS rate, do we charge the site where the provider is or the site where the patient is? So I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing these are two FQHC, so it would be the distance site provider who would be billing because they're providing the service, and then the, uh, for the site where the patient is at, they would be charging the originating site fee, uh, if I'm understanding this question correctly. Um, and it's assuming that your state Medicaid office is going to pay a PPS for, uh, for the professional services at an FQHC. But assuming it is, then yeah, you would, you would bill it out of the providers, whatever organization the provider is with. Yeah, because for, for those who maybe not be aware, Medi underneath Medicare, um, FQHCs are not considered an eligible distance site provider. Um, they will be under some Medicaid programs, not all of them. So, so be aware of that. And if you're thinking of what we're talking about with like the virtual check-ins and everything, you're not billing your PPS rate. You, you don't get to bill that. You have to bill the rate that they're going to say that that service is going to have which is going to be similar to what a non-FQHC would have to do or get. Um, let's see. In regards to the DEA registry, I think you said they have within a year to establish this. Is that a calendar year or a specific date in 2019? Um, I'm going to double check with Christine. I think it's 2019. They have exactly one year to do it. Yeah, I think it's 2019.
Uh, get, re get ready for potential delays. I have noticed that sometimes when they have like a deadline, sometimes they'll ask for an extension and it might be delayed. So that may happen. May not, but may happen. <laughs> so um, any idea of ambulance-based telestroke will be considered a mobile strike unit? I, I think that's what they were thinking of when they used mobile strike unit, when I use that term. Uh, but it wasn't, it, I don't think it was, it wasn't spelled out specifically by CMS in, in their in the proposal, but I think that's probably what they're thinking of is if you have like an ambulance who may have some of those, that technology or capabilities within the ambulance to provide that service. Is the new modifier for telestroke currently effective or does it go into effect in January 2019, 2019 January? It, none of these, none of these things that we went over are effective now. They start January 1st, 2019, unless we specified another day, like when Christine was talking the Medicare Advantage plan, they're just planning, essentially, especially right now, they're gathering comments and they're planning for it and it doesn't really keep them until January. Does a phone call count as electronic exchange for MA plan reimbursement? They, they do use that as, as an example uh, for the electronic exchange. However, it will be up to the Medicare um, Advantage plan as to whether or not they're going to pay for it. And they also need to be offering that service in person. So Medicare is moving away from using the GT modifier and moving to using point of service, correct? Is Medicare requiring their point of service to be used with all of the new codes you went over in this presentation? So the codes that were specifically new telehealth codes, they're still going to be required point of service. So the codes that, such as the virtual check-in and so forth, they're not going to need like a modifier. It's like those codes essentially are, are the codes. So they, they know what that is and you would not need to like identify it with a modifier. Except for a cute stroke. They, they said they're coming up with like a cute stroke modifier, so that will have its own modifier as well. Um, this, I, I do think the whole modifier situation is a little bit of a mess because you have what Medicare is doing and then you have what states are trying to do and other plans are trying to do, so it is a little bit jumbled, especially if you're a telehealth provider who maybe operates with multiple payers and multiple states, it can get very confusing. But as far as like what we went over today, the specific there were about two of them, specific telehealth codes, those who still require the point of service codes, um, the virtual check-in and the asynchronous version of that, those are their own codes. They would not require the modifier and a huge stroke has its own special modifier. Uh, my understanding is that Medicare will deny coverage for any claims with EX code F11.20 series OUD. You mentioned changes in the Medicare policies for treatment, telehealth treatment of OUD, specifically MAT medication, such treatment with suboxone, buprenorphine, has not previously been covered by Medicare, yet you mentioned it in the slide. Has that changed? So I am not specifically up as to far as far as like what drugs are covered by Medicare, and apparently they are not covering suboxone slash buprenorphine. Um, so what they are just have they said regarding telehealth is that they will now cover some of the services if provided via telehealth. But I think it's probably so. So what you have to remember is. Let me just double check to make sure I am saying this correctly regarding this. Is is that I think it's more the counseling side of things that they're probably covering. So it's not necessarily we are going to be covering your drugs and the prescribing of drugs, but we're going to counsel, we're going to cover more the counseling service involved with therapy as opposed to the medication side. And that is what we're seeing a lot of with some of the policy changes or policy proposals, both on the federal and state level. It's been really concentrated on the use of telehealth and providing those counseling services underneath MAT, not necessarily the the drug side and administrating that because we do run up against other 
laws that are um, preventing that or like restrict that to keep them out of that. So it's more on the, the counseling, mental, behavioral health side. Unless Jonathan, do you want to add anything to that? No. Okay. So next question. Does the data captured for RPM need, need to be documented in a certified EMR in order to bill for CPT code 99457? I don't think they were clear on that or they were specific regarding that. They shook her head on that. Yeah, I think they might be issuing additional guidance on that eventually to on those specific codes to specify more details. Yeah, yeah but there is, is what well, you need to do, Christine. Um, um, the, uh, the, there's this, the certified EHR language got into a lot of the chronic care management and collaborative care codes um, that, um, but that's, but those are a separate set of codes and remote patient monitoring physiological data, they didn't use that same language in collecting remote physiological data, RPM data. Um, so I think we're, un I, well, so we're unclear on that at this point, I guess. If an originating site is contracting with another organization for telehealth professional services, can the originating site then bill for the professional fee as well as the originating site fee if your contract agreement allows? This is one I get a lot. John, he's smiling. Yeah, I get this a lot. Um, so, uh, so what what what's happening in? One of, the, one of the things that I recommend organizations when you're talking about this, um, because is that you adopt a certain set of language. What, what, what's happening here is that we're talking, we're mixing um, the idea that Medicare recognizes of um, uh, assigning billing, which is a pretty standard thing in healthcare to assign billing. You know, you sign me up as a provider and I assign billing to you and then you as an organization, you bill for my services. So we're talking about assignment of billing, and then we're talking about telehealth. And in, at CMS, these two concepts somehow don't overlap, and that's a problem. Um, I think that, it, that it, they're now aware that these two issues can overlap and do overlap in the real world. It's just that they don't have policies. They don't, they don't immediately know how they overlap. So. I will tell you that there are experts who will tell you absolutely if you're entitled to bill for a clinical service, um, you bill for that. And if you're entitled to bill as an originating site and you meet their criteria, then you go ahead and bill for that. Um, and I think, and there's nothing, I think that advice is on target. I have also heard from organizations and from payers who say if we have the same organization sending us an originating site and a profi bill for the same service, we're not going to pay them both. You can't bill for both, that's double dipping. And I think that's a misunderstanding, so you may have to work this through. You're gonna, I mean, this won't be the first bill you have to call a payer on and say, hey, why didn't you pay this claim? Um, and and you know, make, the, make the rationale uh, and make the argument for why it's a valid claim. Um, so, uh, so the short answer, I guess, is, is yes, you can do that. Be, uh, you know, don't be surprised if, you, if the payer uh, rejects it or denies it once or twice and you have to get on the phone and explain why that's the case. There are some state Medicaid's also who specifically say we will not pay both. If you're going to bill a pro fee, we're not going to pay you an, origi an originating site fee. And that's certainly their prerogative to, to put that in policy. Um, so if it's not in policy, you may have to argue it. And if it's not in policy, don't be surprised because it's one of those things. Telehealth uncovers a lot of you know, sort of unwritten policies, and you may have to just get on the phone with somebody and, and work it out. All right, next question. If living in the eligible rural area, can patient with Medicare with any condition be at home or at any site, and we can do telemedicine from a hospital facility and be reimbursed? No, not, not any condition. The only exception now is the end-stage renal disease, and in, in a few more months, um, the opioid treatment, mental, uh, co 
occurring mental condition. So those are the only two exceptions which don't allow the home to be originally in sight. Um, or telehousers is now, again, virtual check-in. If you're just doing a virtual check-in type of thing, that can take place at home and that could be for whatever condition you're checking in with your provider for. But if you're just talking about the telehealth exception, that those are the only two exceptions you can have. Right. That's why we keep making the making this best or you keep specifying that these new services like the virtual check in Medicare doesn't call them telehealth because all of these rules they have about telehealth are not applying to the new services. That's why we can make that distinction. For patients on opioids for pain, can we prescribe ongoing monthly opioid refills with telemedicine being the monthly assessment? Um, it could be. The question is, depending on like what their payer is, it, will they reimburse for that monthly assessment? Uh, and also, if like the payer, maybe they have like some other requirements for it. But but the the whole the Ryan and Hate Act again. I said it earlier. What it covers is the actual prescribing of it. So what comes afterwards? Now the and I, I've always thought this was a gray area. What if you change the prescription? you went from one dosage and then you had to write a new prescription to like a lower dosage, then the Zorian Hayden Act comes in, you know, kick in because it's a different prescription. It, I, it's I don't bit. think so. I, I think that, I mean, well, once you've, once you've established care in a face, in a, in a in-person encounter, Medicare calls it face to face, but in person, then, then the restrictions of Ryan hate don't apply anymore. You have established care in person and you can continue prescribing. Okay. So, it's always been a little bit of a gray, I think. So, but I, I think it go either way. I agree with Jonathan that that's also valid what he just said. But it's always been a little bit gray, and it's always been something that I've always raised. And said, but what does happen if you have changed it, the prescription? You've got to write a new dosage or a different type of medication. That's something I really wanted to raise, unless it inadvertently messes somebody up. So, um, let's see. The next question. If, if we were to use an employed provider who is working from home to do virtual check-ins for store board, what address do we use on the claim form and is this allowed by HRSA? Does it require a change of scope for FQHC? Do you want to take it, Jonathan? Or? Um, they, okay, so the provider has to be an FQHC or RHC provider. It doesn't, they don't have to be employed and that, um, but they do have to be one of your providers. I mean, whatever it takes for you to, for them to become your provider. So you can have contracted employees or contracted providers, just like any other organization can. They're not eligible for FTCA unless they're employed. Um, but, um, but as long as they are valid FQHC, RHC providers providing the service, then they can do that virtual check-in according to the the way the the uh, regulation is written um the location of service is the fqhc um although um we're still a little unclear whether you're going to build that as a pos 2 right telehealth i think i think we've agreed that it's not pos 2 because those services are not telehealth per se so the location of service for a virtual check-in is is going to be the FQHC, the site of the FQHC. Even though neither the doctor nor the patient is there, um, I, and I'll, 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 I say this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna also issue a caveat here. My hunch is that though some folks at CMS probably have considered this possibility, not many, and it was not, um, when it comes up, it's going to surprise a lot of people. Oh, really? A doctor doesn't have to be at the clinic to provide a virtual check-in? A doctor could be a valid FQHC provider, but not be sitting in the clinic when they're providing the, the, the check-in. That's going to, there's going to be some pushback and some, some uh, controversy or discussion about that. But um, my reading of the regulation is that, yes, you could do that. For those people who can't see, Christina and I are nodding her head. Oh, and as far as scope goes, scope has to do with the clinical service that you're providing. My understanding is that a virtual check-in does not change your scope. 
Um, that's a different way of providing healthcare. It's the same thing you're doing now. Now, if you're if your virtual provider who doing virtual check-ins is now providing, well, they can't be providing mental health services because that's not what you're billing for. You're billing for a virtual medical check-in. And so the scope has to do with whether you're now providing mental health on site or cardiology on site. Um, those are the kinds of things that require change of scope. But virtual check-in for things that you're already doing for the providers you already have or the provider or the services that you are that are already in your scope, then you don't need to change a change of scope for that. It seems as a sort of training it like it's just a little added for FQHC, but it's not like you're expanding your scope of services and then you're at it. It's just like another it's attached to like what you're already doing in some ways, and we're giving you a little bit of money to cover your costs. All right, uh, Christine, I'm going to throw this next one to you. It says, California Medi-Cal will be enforcing guideline in 2019 that provider distance sites cannot be outside the state of California with the exception of, quote, border county. Will this apply to all managed Medi-Cal plans, specifically partnership health plans? So first off, I will say that we cannot speak for partnership, but I'll toss it over to Christine. Um, so I think you are referring to the, uh, proposal, um, for, um, for the new telehealth policy that, uh, Medi-Cal has proposed. And I think it's not exactly clear in there whether or not, um, out-of-state providers are going to be eligible. And I lost, I lost the question here. Um, I So anyways, the question was whether or not border state providers would be eligible. Was that it? Does anybody remember? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, well Medi-Cal Medi is enforcing a guideline, guideline or proposing proposed. that, that the distance site can't, can't be outside the state, the state except for border counties. counties. So, so close, close to the to border. The yeah, I, I think that... Um, uh, that the that the uh, policy it was not exactly clear and it hasn't been finalized yet, and so um, and so we're going to wait to see what what Medi-Cal uh, decides to do. There was uh, a call for uh, comments on that proposal, and they're going to be doing a webinar on December seventeenth, I believe, and hopefully they will clarify that. Yeah, I yeah, have a I comment have on that, that too. Go ahead and mute. There you go. Um, because I, I get a related question on this one, and it's it, it might be a little counterintuitive, but organizations telehealth telehealth is often conceptualized as being done by two organizations, right? An originating site where the patient is, and a distance site where the provider is. A lot of telehealth, possibly most telehealth, actually doesn't follow that model. What happens is that you contract with a provider, a, a primary care site or a service site of some kind, a clinic of some kind contracts with a provider, brings them onto their medical staff, that person virtually enters the four walls and sees patients, they assign benefits to the, the clinic, and then that clinic bills, right? So in that sort of a scenario, the distant site and the originating site are the same, referring back to that earlier question that somebody asked. So whether the provider is located in California or Massachusetts or a border county or anywhere else, the question is, is that relevant anymore? And a lot of folks in the telehealth world will say, well, no, it's not relevant. They've assigned benefits, they're licensed. They have to be licensed at the location where the client or the patient is in order to be a valid assignment of benefits in order for the clinic to actually bill for their services. They have to be a licensed provider in California. But is the fact that they're sitting in Montana or Pennsylvania, does it make any difference? And so I think that's part of what needs to be clarified because the distant site 
is going to be the cl the client site, the originating site. They're going to be the same site under a under a an assignment of benefits scenario. So um, now in a traditional thing where you've got a provider billing out of their own clinic and they're in another state, that definitely is not going to be allowed in, in under this proposal. But um, but the alternative arrangement is much less clear. And that alternative arrangement is specifically um, allowed in California Medicaid for FQHCs and RHCs. So whether, you know, there's going to be a little bit of a little bit of mush here, a little bit of sausage making going on, I'm sure. Our next question, does the data captured for rebel patient monitoring need to be documented in a certified EMR in order to bill for CPT code 99457? That's one of those chronic care management codes. I don't, I'm trying to remember, and I'm, I'm looking at Christine, I don't think yeah, they specified down to that, that that's required. Yeah, I don't think that was specified. Okay. Uh, what is a DEA registered facility? I have a pra private practice. So a DEA registered facility is basically you go through this process with the DEA in order to, to register that you could basically prescribe and administer you know, substances from, from your location. They're usually for clinics such as um, methadone clinics. It, so what, that's why earlier, probably this question came up because earlier I said I think that uh, earlier question person who raised a question had a private practice is usually not a doctor's office, it's usually like a clinic. Um, and that is one of the, the exceptions that's given for telehealth underneath the Ryan Hate Act is when the patient is located in one of those DEA uh, registered facilities and then the provider prescribing is coming in through telehealth, that's when they can't do it without that particular provider having met the patient in person and conducted an exam because they're in a DEA registered facility. That's when they can't uh, prescribe the control substance via telehealth. So if you have a private practice, it's probably your office is probably not going to qualify under that exception. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, but you know, again, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's for specific types of clinics that are allowed. And Jonathan looks like he wants to say something. Yeah, you're you're right, and your best bet there as a strategy is to pair up with a clinic that does exist and has has a DEA certification if you want to do that sort of work. But it's it's. As a private practitioner, you're probably outside that game on your own, if you're on your own. In an interprofessional internet consultation, which provider is eligible to bill Medicare for the consultation? The primary care doctor requesting a consult or the distance site provider supplying the response or both? Is there a specific platform that Medicare requires for the EMS? So the answer is both. So Medicare did come up with codes that both the primary care provider can use and the uh, specialist, quote unquote, distance site provider um, can use as well. Keep in mind though that there were specific definitions for those codes. So and in them were specific time requirements. Um, so if you didn't meet the time requirements, you probably couldn't go. Let's say it took you five minutes. Or no, I think there was a code that said like less than. So it depends on which code you're going to go, um, depending on how much time it took. But there are codes open to go essentially the primary care provider and the specialist to use. Um, is there a specific platform? Again, no, they didn't specify a you know, specific type or you know, specific company. Nobody was supposed to use it. Does the uh, physiological data captured for the RPM to document sort of update back to repeat the previous question? Let's see. How many, if any, face to face? Visits are required for dialysis centers in rural areas of services provided from remote nephrologists. I'm not sure that there was ever like a specific number required. Yeah, I don't think there was a specific number on that. How can we be sure to get notified about upcoming webinar on 1217 regarding the 2019 Medi-Cal guidelines. Um, I would, uh, so that one, that's coming out of Department of Healthcare Services here in California. And I actually was double checking their website and I have not seen anything about that. I need to, to speak to them like I have their DHCF to make sure it's still on for the 17th. But I would keep an eye maybe on um, 
TCHQ's website because, or uh, sign off for one of our newsletters because we will inform uh, people who subscribe to the newsletters who put something in there about that regarding the uh, upcoming web, uh, webinar when it when it's finalized and scheduled and calendared in, and when there's a registration. On behalf of the FQHC from California, the CTRC has issued a November 2018 guide stating that our providers can bill PPS for telehealth visits even if the patient is at home. When pressed to get approval from fee-for-service Medi-Cal, we cannot find approval mechanism for this. Is there any evidence that this will be allowed? I can't speak for CTRC. I have not looked at their guidelines closely. Um, I will say this. So we're talking about California, the California Medicaid program, Medi-Cal. So as was discussed earlier, they have come out with new uh, proposals regarding their Medi-Cal reimbursement program that will impact fee-for-service, that will impact uh, Medi-Cal managed care as well. As far as FQHCs are concerned, two things are happening here in California. The FQHCs are also impacted by some of those changes they came out with a proposed change to the FQHC policy and Medi-Cal related to telehealth. There is also a state plan amendment regarding FQHC and how they use telehealth that has been submitted or had, had at least comments. I don't, I'm not quite sure if it's been submitted to the federal government. Um, so there is possibly two things impacting the FQHC use of telehealth policy um, going on that are pending. Currently, what is going on, so the current policy here in California regarding FQHCs and telehealth, as far as location is concerned, what Medi-Cal has said underneath the current policy is that the home can be an eligible or retained site, but a healthcare provider must be with the patient at the time of the telehealth interaction. So that has actually um, prevented a lot of FQHCs from having such a program where they would treat the patient in the home because that would require them to have like you know personnel with or somebody um, that's a healthcare professional with the patient at the time. So it, it kind of defeats the purpose in, in some way. Um, so I'm I, as I said I can't speak for CTRC. I have not looked at their their recent update. I knew they made one uh, and issued it, but I haven't looked at it. Um, it will probably need to be revised fairly soon if the uh, proposed changes go through Medi-Cal. Uh, so, but that is my understanding and my conversations with the HCS about current policy and um, what I can tell you about potential future changes coming down in California for during the years. And I don't know if Christine wanted to add anything to that or not. No, I think you about covered it. And that is the last of our questions. So, and we are, and you guys are great because we are right at our hour. We're two minutes before. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone. You might be getting an eval from Ray um, later on regarding this. I know that there were some mic issues. Definitely, like when I would speak on my end, I apologize for that, but this will be recorded. So, um, if you missed anything, feel free to go ahead and listen to the recording or shoot an email. To me, Christine or Jonathan, we're always happy to, to help and talk to them. So I hope you found some useful information on this. Check out uh, both our websites, both uh, the Great Plains Telehealth Resource Centers and the Center for Connected Health Policy. You'll find a lot of information there as well. If there are any new developments or any uh, new information, we will definitely inform folks. Uh, so thank you all again, and I hope everybody has a great day. And thank you also to my co-presenters, Christine and Jonathan.